uh, what we have to cover here is uh, what are enzymes basically. Now before we talk about enzymes though, I just want to give you an example of a situation. All right. Okay. In chapter two, you learned about something called starch. There were two types of starch molecules, uh, amylose and amylopectin. And I'm drawing out an amylose molecule over here. As you can see, amylose is just basically made up of many alpha glucose joined together by something known as alpha 1,4 glycosidic bonds. All right. So let's say, for example, we want to break the glycosidic bond. To break the alpha 1,4 glycosidic bond, we need to carry out a reaction known as hydrolysis. And what is hydrolysis, by the way? Hydrolysis just basically means using water to break the covalent bond. In this case, to break the glycosidic bond. So, I'm drawing out a water molecule over there, represented as H2O. Now, if the water molecule were to just daintily go and touch the glycosidic bond, it just touches it. Uh, will the water molecule break the glycosidic bond? Or does adding water immediately break the glycosidic bond? The answer is actually no. You see, water cannot break the glycosidic bond immediately. So, okay, if, okay, consider this situation then. If you were to take rice, all right, which contains a lot of starch, by the way, and if you were to just immediately add water to the rice, Will will the starch inside the rice just break down and become glucose immediately? No, it, it does not. So you might be thinking to yourself, wait a minute, have I been lied to? Because in chapter 2, you were told that to break these covalent bonds, such as glycosidic bonds, you needed to carry out something known as hydrolysis, which is using water. So were you lied to? Well, no, you were not lied to exactly. You see... To effectively break the bond, you first need to weaken it, all right? You need water to break the glycosidic bond, but the glycosidic bond is too strong. And by just adding water to the bond, it's not going to cut it. So the water needs to effectively collide with the glycosidic bond at an extremely high energy level or at an extremely high energy I always compare this to a situation. I always tell this to my students. You have your hand and you have a glass window, all right? If you were to just touch the glass window, will it break it? No, it won't, okay? You have to use your hand and punch the glass window at a certain energy level or a certain kinetic energy to break the glass window. By the way, please don't do that, okay? I'm just giving a comparison. I don't want students to start breaking glasses. All right, it's just a comparison. So uh, same thing with water too. If the water is to effectively break the glycosidic bond, the water needs to hit the glycosidic bond at a high energy level. So to effectively break the bond, you need water, but you need to heat the water up and increase its kinetic energy and hopefully it will bash onto the glycosidic bond and break it. All right? But that's the thing. So if you were to eat starch and the starch goes into your body, <laughs> are you then what? Are you supposed to heat your body up to a very high temperature? No, you can't heat your body up to a very high temperature or not you'll turn into ashes. All right. So that's just not feasible. That's not a practical approach to break glycosidic bonds when you eat rice, for example, or when you eat pasta. Um, so in that case, what you need to do is you may need to weaken the bond with a biological catalyst, such as an enzyme. So I'm just drawing an enzyme over there. And what the enzyme actually does is the enzyme. So, uh, so immediately students will go, aha, the enzyme breaks down the bond for us. No, the enzymes do not break down the glycosidic bonds. All the enzyme does is the enzyme weakens the glycosidic bonds so that it's easier for the water to break it down. So that's what uh, enzymes are supposed to do. So that's just an introduction to what, why an enzyme is important. So coming back to the question, what exactly are enzymes then? Uh, enzymes are first and foremost globular proteins. And if you remember in chapter 2, globular proteins are basically proteins with 3D structures. They can be tertiary or quaternary, depending on the situation. They are spherical in shape. Okay, I'm going to link... Uh, 
a video bill in the description so you can go back and do your revision on globular proteins and uh, they are also water soluble because they can interact with water and enzymes are basically known as catalysts now what exactly is the meaning of catalyst so catalysts are just basically molecules or substances which make it easier for the reaction to take place let's just understand that as the definition of catalyst for now i will elaborate on that later but for now that definition is good enough so for example if you have water molecule trying to break the glycosidic bond in the starch will it be able to break it no it won't it just can't break the glycosidic bond because the glycosidic bond is too strong to break down but with the help of an enzyme that weakens the glycosidic bond on the right hand side, the water molecule can easily now break the bond and therefore hydrolysis can happen. Now, the amount of energy needed for the water to break the bond, all right, on the left side, it needs a lot of energy. You need to give the water a lot of energy so that it's able to break the glycosidic bond. That energy is referred to as something known as activation energy. By definition, the energy required for the reaction to take place. But with the help of the enzyme, do you need to give the water a lot of energy or does it need to achieve that high amount of activation energy? No, it does not have to. Because with the help of the enzyme, the enzymes actually weaken the bond. Therefore, the activation energy needed to break the glycosidic bond is much lower. Enzymes make it easier for the reaction to happen by reducing the activation energy for the reaction to occur. All right, that's what enzymes do. So then comes the question, so why are enzymes so important in life? Like what's the big deal about enzymes? Like why do we need enzymes? So I'm just basically throwing out a human a cell here. Uh, remember, just a bit of revision for chapter 1. You can see the nucleus right there in the middle. You can see ATS ribosomes on rough ER. Uh, how do we know that's the rough ER? Because it's a single membrane org organelle with interconnected membranes. Uh, you also see the mitochondrion on the right side, uh, the one in red. And the mitochondrion has a double membrane where it has a smooth outer membrane and folded inner membrane. That's just a revision. Okay, so the function of ribosomes on the rough ER are to synthesize proteins by joining amino acids together. The mitochondrion carries out aerobic respiration where they break down organic molecules such as lipids and even uh, pyruvate, I'll explain this in chapter 13, to synthesize a molecule known as ATP, an important energy molecule. And in your nucleus, your nucleus carries out a very important reaction known as the synthesis of DNA. Now, based on the list that I've written here, within just one cell, we have four different types of chemical reaction. Synthesizing protein is one chemical reaction. Breaking down lipid is a chemical reaction. Synthesizing ATP is a chemical reaction. And synthesizing DNA is a different type of chemical reaction. All these chemical reactions cannot happen without the assistance of enzymes. And you need to have different types of enzymes to actually... Uh, carry out these chemical reactions in the cells. For example, to synthesize protein, an enzyme known as peptidyltransferase is needed. To synthesize ATP, you need an enzyme known as ATP synthase. To break down lipids, you need something known as acyl-CoA dehydrogenase. And to synthesize DNA, you need two different types of enzymes known as helicase and DNA polymerase. Immediately, as students, you might go, do I have to memorize all this? No, you don't have to memorize all this. You will be introduced to some of these enzymes in the future. For example, helicase and DNA polymerase will come back to haunt you in chapter 6. Uh, ATP synthase will be in chapter 13 of... Was it chapter 13? No, chapter 12 of A2 Biology. All right? But you don't need to memorize all these enzymes right now. The point I'm just trying to make is your cells carry out a lot of different types of chemical reactions and all these chemical reactions are assisted by different types of enzymes. The interesting thing here that we know about all these different enzymes are their names end with the letter ACE at the back, A-S-E. Transfer ACE, synthase, dehydrogen ACE, 
and polymer ace and helicase. I'm highlighting all over that so that you can see. So that just gives you an idea that most, not all enzymes, but most enzymes basically have their names ending with the alphabets ace at the back. So long story short, enzymes are just basically globular protein. They reduce the activation energy. How do they reduce the activation energy? I'll talk about that later. Uh, so they reduce the activation energy required for a chemical reaction to happen. And they are important for biological reactions in and out of the cell. And of course, they usually end in the alphabets ACE, although not all the time, most of the time anyway.